Hello and welcome back to the Halo series. My name is Douglas Brown, CEO at Halo Consulting. Today we are joined by Andy Christensen, North American Vice President of the Partner Ecosystem at Unit 4. Today marks our 33rd Halo series. Thanks for joining us, Andy. How are you today? Doing great, Doug. Thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. It's going to be a good one. Uh, throughout our session, we will discuss from vision to collaboration and building alliances for startup success. Before we start uh, the questions, Andy, um, yeah. can you share with our audience where you started your career and how it evolved into leading the partner ecosystem at Unit 4? Sure, absolutely. And let, let me just start with, with where I'm at with Unit 4 because it probably pertains more just to the, the uh, startup factor. So I joined Unit 4 back in late 2021 um, after spending 23 years at Dell Tech in a partner leadership role. And what we're doing here at Unit 4, we've been around for 40 years, but the allure to, for this position is really in, was at the time an unknown ERP SaaS solution in North America. So we were able to build it from the ground up in North America and really had that grassroots, that startup mentality, the investment from the company, but also having to deliver results quickly um, and getting partners on board with, you know, why Unit 4, why is our solution, why the industries we serve. So it was a really great challenge because I, I came from, like I said, Dell Tech for 23 years, very stable company, great experience there. And, you know, but uh, our experiences there were, I managed probably six different partner channels, all of different levels and complexities. And the fun part of that was always when we acquired somebody to see how strong their partner channel was that we acquired or how poor it was <laughs> and, and be able to navigate that and keep that fresh. And you, you, being on the other side of it, you learn quickly what some companies do right and what they do incorrectly. And then we were able to capitalize on that, getting them in our program, putting in the right people and the resources and the partner management to kind of accelerate that investment that the organization made. But uh, at Unifor, it's been, been great. The I would say it's been super successful from a partnering standpoint here. And just having that energy of something new, and even in an older company to drive has been, uh, it's been pretty fascinating. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah. you've, had, you've had an impressive career across Dell Tech in your time at Unit 4. I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, the, the importance of building a partnership, partnerships function uh, from yeah. the ground up at, uh, at an early stage startup. Yeah. So I think I look at it, there's three categories, you know, kind of the lessons learned, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think around the, you know, when you're out to having dinner with partners or coworkers or peers, usually spend more on the, uh, on the, the bad and the, you know, the, uh, the bad and the ugly, because they're more entertaining, <laughs> frankly. But I think the real key to focus on is really what are the, the good outcomes from a, from a strong partner model and, and, and implementing it correctly. So, there's some really easy hits is one, you know, the customer acquisition cost should be lower leveraging a partner channel. So that's obviously for a startup important. And I think where you can really get the most bang for the buck is getting awareness out into the market. So if you're certain, have certain verticals or markets that you're focusing on, your name's going to carry some weight, but if you can bring in the right partners that already have awareness in that, and they have the trust of that industry and they're going to partner with you and represent you in, in whatever partnering fashion that gives almost immediate credibility. Then it's, then it's up to you to, is, is your solution, you know, is it, is it, is it great? Is it adequate? Is it not as good as you sold it? Do you have the services around it to package it? So it becomes more is your, is, you know, can you fulfill what, what's been told? And I think partners one can help get that in there, but more importantly, they can help, tweak that and work with you to make sure that you're addressing what that market needs. So those are two quick ones on, on the good stories. I'm sure you've heard good, bad, and ugly as well. Um, there's a couple on the, on the bad side, Doug, that I, that I kind of look at is the risk is always you're investing the right time and resources with the right partners because we're all excited. Hey, this company wants to be with us. This company wants to be with us. And it's, you know, you're, kind of grasping who you're going to really spend time with initially. And it's easy to spend time with the wrong people that aren't going to deliver your business needs or they can't deliver what they're telling you. So really weeding those out early um, is important because if you don't, you end up with a, a bad partner story, right? And, and it, you're slower to market and you're slower to success. Yeah, we, uh, 
the, the importance of building a strong partnerships function can, can open up new avenues for, for revenue generation. Uh, it can yep. en enhance brand visibility. Um, it can also provide access to complementary technologies or markets. Um, right. So we, we have seen this uh, work really well in the past with a company called iCertis. Um, in May of 23, uh, they announced a new strategic collaboration between PwC, Microsoft, and iCertis uh, with a focus on innovative AI-driven approach to contract management uh, that enables accelerated enterprise-level digital transformation. Um, so when when uh, when partnerships uh, go well, um, there's uh, there's a lot that can come from them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just that scale, the names you mentioned, right, is just you know super powerful. And if you can get them all to invest and really, you know, lean into it, um, it it's great. And sometimes I see Doug with some some startups and really any organization, they're sometimes more worried about who the name is versus how much that name is going to invest in it. And I won't mention any names, but there's a lot of large organizations that look great on your website. But if they're not going to put a team on, there's not leadership, you know, supporting it, and there's not a clear path on what it can drive for both organizations, I sometimes chalk those up as, eh, it's probably, you're probably spent somewhere at a tier two level because they actually have a bigger need and maybe more, you know, the need for that, that have a bench to do that. But ideally, if you can get those large SIs, the large you know, the Microsofts of the world, the Googles of the world, clearly that's that's where the scale is, especially if you have a good value prop, which can be, and like your story with iService, it's a, it's a great industry example of success. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a good segue into, into discussing the lessons learned that you've encountered yeah. throughout your career, Andy. Um, let's, uh, let's start with the good. Any any good examples that that you can share from yeah yeah for, <laughs> for sure there's i mean there was one that we had at, at where i worked um previous job is we had we hired a, a small organization had a very nice erp very specific vertical and they they touted this great partner program and and i think it was part of the sales pitch right of <laughs> you know how valuable it was and once we dug in there it, there was nothing to it the sales reps were managing partners. There was, there, they couldn't even give us a list in two weeks of who their partners were and what they did as partners. So it was more lip service and anything. Then we dug deeper into it and we found some great opportunities because um, they, had, they had a managed service program. Um, and one of them was part of, a, I would say, a top 10 CP, you know, accounting consulting organization in, in the U.S., but they only worked with two offices and they had 17 other offices out of their 60 that had the exact same customer base. So we were able to expand that really quickly just by kind of, Hey, you're, we're doing it already here. Now you're part of a large organization. So we can back this and set up a center of excellence with them, you know, so they can all of these different you know offices can get the support they needed from their internal company. We obviously put resources into it. So, that was a really cool story is just to be able to, to scale them up and because we had the, the know how to do it and the resources to do it. So, yeah, yeah really, really all positive benefits to, to, to your organization when a partnership yeah. function is, is built the right way. Um, yep. Any 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 examples you're comfortable sharing in terms of the bad? I uh, definitely will not say any names here, and these are these will not be my personal stories. I mean, we could tie it back to who they would have been with either currently or my past job. So, but just from from the field, we've seen you know just where you know I would say on the on the ugly side is the partners misrepresent what your solution can do, and some mm. of that's you know the vendor you know the, us the vendor fault, some of the partner fault, some of it's just Murphy's law. But when they go out and just really oversell and overcommit to things um, that there's no chance they can deliver or then we have to pick it up and solve it. I've, I've heard that multiple, multiple times. It seems to happen in the cybersecurity world, unfortunately, more now than, than in, in other industries from what I've experienced with my peers and networks. Um, but those put companies in a really horrible spot and, and even more importantly, puts the customer in a terrible spot. They've committed all these dollars and these time and resources, and now they're left with something after three months, six months, two years that isn't going to solve their need. And that's just a, you know, that's the ugly side of partnering, you know, where you just don't have that connection. I mean, that, that connection and communication and, and the enablement part is so important, so important. I think that's probably a struggle 
for a lot of startups is that enablement side is because you're we're all running fast trying to do this do that we're wearing different hats and to, i would put you know that enable it's a real key to a great partner program so now you enable the partner but then having that communication back into the company is extremely vital and that has to go up to the leadership leadership has to be willing to listen to the partners of what's working what's not and take their feedback and make adjustments because they're out there they they they're typically typically right not always but typically right or they're somewhere in between and, and that can accelerate the growth and get the right solution for the for the, for the market so sometimes the you know the bad can turn into good but you know bad and ugly are they're rough they're rough but they, they do happen I, I have a follow-up question, Andy. Uh, I know you mentioned that um, communication is a, a critical piece to a successful partnership function. Yeah. And really, after all the time that's spent, the investment, resources, how how can a, an organization recover from a poor experience or, or being misrepresented um, by their by their partner? Yeah, it's 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 that's a great question. Is and. Uh, let me focus where I would typically go with that is, you know, if there's a partner out misrepresenting that happens. Most likely that relationship is going to die or it's going to go into some holding pattern uh, unless there, we can figure it out. But where my mind goes to, what does that do for the other partners in the ecosystem? Because a bad story in the market impacts them. So how do we let them know what we can share with them, what has happened? What are we doing about it? And then how are we pivoting and how should they leverage that change? Um, so there, that's where I would say some of the good can come. It's like, hey, we found this. Um, we need to collect, circle the wagons and make sure we're all on the same page. Because again, they're representing your brand. Someone else is making it look poor. That, that costs them. That costs them. So that's where I think that transparency, just that open line of communication with the product team, our sales team, with our marketing team, the leadership, the services team, if you can build that and there's trust factor both ways, you, you can solve problems you, and you won't have bad man messaging. You may have some issues with customers because that happens in business, but those are all solvable and fixable. Um, and it, and it's, I think that's the key is just letting them know what's happened, whether it's good, great or bad, and making sure they're, they feel like they're part of the team because you know what they are they're investing millions of dollars in mm -hmm. people's livelihoods in your partnership they, they deserve a, a seat at the table absolutely and before we move on uh one one last quick question yeah. um you mentioned sometimes uh you 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 might have a case where the bad goes to good any yeah. any, any example you can share from kind of your past experience oh, yeah. where oh yeah 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 it was <laughs> it was um again uh, this this was at a Current role, so we'll we'll stay unit four here. Is we did I did inherit a, a you know a couple partners that were here long term and had good good business practices, but not necessarily the greatest education internally, and that's kind of one of the things I I look at that as a challenge. Like there's no way what a group thinks about someone else is is accurate. They're they're never as great as you think they are. They're never as bad as they are. It's gonna be somewhere in the in the middle. So I, I kind of look at that as a reclamation project. Like, okay, if this, if they're viewed as this, there's probably some reason for go figure it out the partner. Tell them, hey, this is what we're hearing, right? It's not a great relationship. You're not selling. You're not providing great services. And I'll go general here just because there's, you know, it wasn't that bad a story, you know, example. But just that when this happens is get them to understand how they're viewed and then let them come back and say, well, you're right on these two things, but we're doing these nine things that people aren't even aware of. And then you build up their store, you build up their bit, rebuild their business plan. And then internally you get to go back and share that with people and, and kind of, and you have to do it in a gentle way because people have opinions for a reason and just re-educate the value of the, of that partnership, the importance of the partnership for the organization, and then educate them on what value they are doing and, and, customer feedback and sales feedback. And all of a sudden you can really swing the tide of, oh, this is fantastic. And sometimes people are just happy that someone like myself or my team is paying attention to it. And so, so a lot of times they just don't know that people are, are doing what we do in, in the channel business. And you gotta educate internally, but you also gotta get the partners to elevate their game. And, and so it can turn from you know, the, the bad to the good very quickly in most cases. 
great. Thanks for sharing that example, Andy. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we want to move on and discuss the strategic partnership framework. Yeah. Um, and there are a couple of pillars that, that we want to highlight for the audience. Um, and the first pillar is defining clear objectives. Um, yeah. Can you shed a little light on that, Andy? Yeah, and you know, we could probably spend a few days on you know, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the strategic partnership framework. But you know, looking at the defining clear objectives, you know, you, let me ask you a question first, Doug, since you, you recruit into you know, for these startups, how, how do you view their vision? Like, do most of them have this great, clear objective? Is it kind of fuzzy? Because you've got to sell somebody on taking a role in an organization like that. So what is what is your experience on on that? Yeah, it uh, it, it really depends on the, the executive leadership team and the kind of um, the, the roadmap and, and framework that they want to follow. Um, yeah. you know, we've had clients where, um, you know, uh, a GSI might be, you know, handed to this individual coming in and, you know, they, the, the ELT is looking at this individual to really come with the vision, the strategic framework and the approach, um, yeah. where we've had other clients where, you know, there, there is the, 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 the guidebook or playbook, so to say that, that they yeah. want to follow. Um, so it's really a, a case by case scenario, but we have seen, um, more and more often that we, uh, the individual that we're recruiting, um, you know, has the autonomy to come in and, um, you know, run things. You know, that, yeah. 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 And, and that's, I mean, and that I would look at that as, as the key is you, you know, we can have our, you know, our, the objective for the partner program, but it has to start with the top, right? The yep. top of your, what is the company's objective and what are the key pillars of it? And then we can fit into really any of those. So we start there and then, yeah, then we make that, you know, what it, what is the, the objective for this partner program? Do we want implementation partners? Do we want SIs? Do we want resellers, co-sell partners? Do you want just alliance partners, you know, or, or all of them? Um, so really defining each one of those is where that focus. And then, then, then once you have that of, you know, what is each one of those going to do for the brand recognition or enhancement of the product or driving business, you know, driving, driving revenues for the organization. So those, those I would say is, is kind of the key, but the key is if it's weak up top, your partner program is going to be weak. And what I've seen, um, through some of my very good peers in the industry is, um, and again, going back to the cyber world, is their their objective is pretty weak and they have this grand idea, we're just gonna go all through partners and then six months later, their margins aren't high enough and partner program's gone. And I've seen the opposite, like we need to go everything to partners. And it's it, it that kind of scares me because I, I know that happens, but there should be no I've never come up heard a good reason why it should be one or the other or just something so completely, you know, overturned. That that to me sounds the company's probably in trouble or the leadership's in trouble. It's kinda of like, you know, the football coach gets fired, but they get a new quarterback first, then you gotta get a new co coach, and then you gotta get a new general manager, <laughs> and it takes years. And it kind of looks at that. But I you know, if you can build those clear objectives, that will enable your team and your marketing folks to go find build that then what's the ideal customer partner profile and then you just start working down there and andy when, when we think about the the customer profile or icp that you know yeah. a startup may want to go after you know it, it'll definitely vary based on you know product market fit but can, can you share any context on you know the um the difference between an, an si a hyperscaler a reseller or like a gsi yeah yeah for sure and and i think there's no right answer for any organization of who you should have, but you know, if you're, I think it, Doug, it would even say it comes back to identifying what your organization wants to be great at. Mm -hmm. So some organizations, you know, frankly, are getting out of delivering services. They, they'll have the solution, you know, here's our SaaS offering, we'll do that, we'll support it, but we want someone else to scale when it comes to implementations and, in, you know, they'll probably do the they, the integration work around that. Um, most of our vendors don't have that capability. And there's, you know, there's SIs, you know, Accenture, BDO, PwC, you go down the list, that they, that's their sweet spot. They know how to sell it. And more importantly, they can staff it and they can deliver it. And the staffing's kind of the key. So I would, just to back that up is figure out what your organization is going to be good at. And then you can fill in where that partner fits in. 
Well said. Uh, let's move on to strategic partner selection. Yeah. What do you want to know on that one? <laughs> how, one. <laughs> how, how, how do you ensure that your partnership agreements benefit both parties fairly? Yeah. That, this is probably, I think, the, what I really, if you pick the top five things you enjoy in your, in your job, <laughs> Career, this would be one of them, right? Is how do how do you make it successful for both of, for both organizations and the customer, and that that is so key because you've got to get the internal team aligned on that it's okay for your partners to be profitable, and then once they're okay with that, then you have to convince them like no, it's we need them to be profitable because the more profitable they are, the more they can grow, the more they can invest, whether it's with us or in their organization healthier they are the better right so i think internally is a huge part of it like are we really going to support them are we going to stand them up and are we going to be excited for them when they're making you know making the revenue goals that they have because it'll, it'll come back to us in a positive way no doubt about it, it always does um, and then i think it's just those that partner you know when you the selection i kind of talked about it earlier is are, is your team's time going to be well spent so there's, there's some quick hits that we all try to find, like, hey, they've got customers where we're going after and we can, we can take them on because they're looking for a home. Well, that's usually a pretty good move or there's longer, you know, there's longer plays. So at unit four, our, our typical um, ERPs were mid-market. So these are 12 to 24 month pursuits. So they're, you know, so these partnership plays are long. And so the ROI on them is great, but they have to be able to invest over a number of years to, to get that return. Um, so that's that's where it becomes critical that are these people that can deliver, right? Can they help find the opportunities? Can they help win the business? And then more importantly, can they deliver uh, on the back end? Um, and I, I think you can get to that, frankly, myself, teams I've worked with in the past, we get it through conversations and business planning, and you can smell pretty quickly if they're going to be off in an area, or if we're not going to have what it takes for them to be successful. That happens too. You know, so we have to say no to people just like, hey, you know what? We don't have these components for our program. So it's going to be really hard for you to, to be successful here. Um, and we had that recently at Unit 4. There was a market we dabbled in for a number of years, and we made the conscious decision for the right way like we're not selling to that space anymore we're, we're wasting time and resources and it's 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 not our it, we're not the right fit and i constantly get partners like hey we can do this and this and like, you know what we won't we won't have a team that will support your efforts and it, you know that would be bad for you. Um, you know, we could milk them along for a few years and hope that something happens but you, you, you just know when, when, it, when it's going to be right and it's not Andy, when, when we think about a startup and as they mature from like a series A to a series B or beyond and really yeah. achieve that product market fit, how how do you adapt your partner selection criteria or strategy as as the startup continues to evolve, grow, and mature? Yeah. Well, that's where you should be able to get scale, right? That's when you should be able to, you know, accelerate. And I would just it would depend on the on the market. At at Dell Tech, we we would scale with um, just again to the type of transactions we had and the customers we had. We would just add more, more of the right partners, not thousands, but you know, on the smaller scale where they could cover the right geography and the right vertical. And at the end of the day, it would all add up to great growth and great long-term <laughs> ARR. Um, and then there's the other side, um, which we're doing here at Unit Four, where it's way less partners. Um, but they can they can do more and they're and they're more sizable deals. So getting those 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 SI relationships, those alliance relationships, like we've got a great relationship with Dayforce, formerly Ceridian. Um, you know, they have the name recognition, they have the customers, and the way our solutions can work together, that's you know, that can scale out at a massive, massive level. So there's a, there's a few different ways, but I you know, went smaller at you know, smaller more, larger, probably less. Got it. Let's uh, let's move on to the next pillar, Andy. Yeah. Um, building relationships. What's what's the importance behind building strong relationships? Your team, hundred percent. Your team. Um, 
because everything you're you know, that I'm talking about with a partner, you know, the, the teams I ha have have had, same, right? They got the same the same tone, different way of delivering it, but that they're committed to the partner. And again, it's another enjoyable thing. We're we you have to be completely committed to your partners and their success. And at the same time, where you work is you know equally important. So everything you do is trying to drive business for both organizations. So I think, you know, building that relationship is is having the right people who get up and you know work every day. But they also in in partner world, especially in in you know startups, is you've got to wear a lot of different hats. You're not just you know managing deals and opportunities and pipeline. You're trying to figure out how support can help them out with the question. You probably have to sit in some product meetings. You know, you've got to work with marketing on marketing plans and events and maybe not run those, but you have to be intelligent at all. So I think that's the key is just getting people who are flexible and knowledgeable in, in the entire business. And, and that takes time because um, the more you can bring that back to the partner and, and bring their stuff back to us as the vendor, it's critical. That's great. And I think, I think a lot of channel people like myself would attest is you develop a great relationship with these people over time that, and that could be a matter of months or years when you win, when you win together, right? That builds a great relationship or, or to my, you know, story earlier, if someone didn't have the greatest relationship and you make it better, well, all of a sudden you've got a, you've got a business friend at that point. And, and that, you know, that I think we're all looking for experiences that bring a little bit of joy to the, you know, to your, to your daily life or, and to someone else's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really well said, Andy. When, when we think about, um, you know, a CRO in an early stage startup, um, you know, wanting to pursue the exploration of, of a partnerships function, uh, and really, you know, say they, they have the, the strategy and plan kind of built out in, in terms of reaching out to the SIs, the, the hyperscalers of the world, yeah. Where, where should someone start in terms of identifying the right point of contact and, you know, how, how frequently or often should they be reaching out to try and um, get on the radar of, uh, yeah. of a potential partner? Um, the, the, how, how often is, I would say, a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's any sales cycle, right? Biz dev cycle. You, you've, you've got to show that you're, you're here all the time. And then once you get, you know, a little bit of feel, and then, then you got to go at their pace, maybe accelerate it a little bit, right? Cause again, all these people are busy. They're all super successful. They probably aren't even necessarily looking for another partner. So, so you've got to kind of build that, that trust, uh, early on, even without great, you know, in-depth conversations, that can be frustrating because that's what we want to go, right? Just let us have a meeting and figure this out. It'll take us four hours if we have something here. Um, easier said from our side of the table than the <laughs> other side. So, um, but I think you've got to, you've got to stay on them. And then if you can find the events that they're at or events that you can invite them to, whether it's you know, your, your own event or some industry event, that I found you can connect with people really quickly. We did that, we were able to do that with one of our good top partners here at Unifor BDO is um, we were able to do a few events. And we didn't co-sponsor them because you know, they're, they're, you know, they, they want to make sure they're neutral, but we were able to find some events where we were, had the right people there, they had the right people and customers and prospects. And we were able to kind of start working on that relationship and business plan before we, before we had a business plan. And that was planned, right? That was that was a planned effort. It wasn't happenstance. Um, and just you have to be, you have to know where they're going to be and, and what's going to be interesting for them to spend time with you at that event. Uh, I found that to be super successful. Unfortunately, events just don't happen enough. So you're you're on a timeline. Oh, it's next fall. It feels like an eternity, right? When you're <laughs> in partnering, right? It's like next fall. Come on, it's April. All right. Well, only only a couple months away. It'll probably be here sooner than we think. It is. It is. But you'd rather just like get. I. I I'd rather let's cut to the chase and figure out if we have something here or not. Mm -hmm. Because then once they're a partner, well, then you've got the ramp up period. So um, again, just and that's maybe the time management of just making sure you've got the right people. You know, trying to talk to each other. Let's figure it out. It doesn't it doesn't take that much to figure out if there's a fit. 
really doesn't. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the uh, the go-to-market strategy and, yeah. and approach. Um, I know there are a couple of things that, that we want to cover here, Andy, and this is really the, the meat and potatoes um, of yeah, our conversation sure. today. Um, I think the one of the, the, the things that we wanted to start talking about was was niche targeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's going to be the key, Is is, and it goes back to your, you know, what's the the organizational focus where where's the company going and you know the, the startup may be going here great we can then we need that partner to latch on and there may be some things to the side that a partner can add value in too so i think finding those niche markets because the challenge we have is convincing that potential partner to spend money with us and time and people and and you know it, it's a it's a lot it's a big ask of people i think people underestimate what a partner really puts into it to to be successful. Um, it's, it's a huge investment, time commitment when they could be doing what they're probably doing great today and that would be good enough. So um, so I think you have to be able to identify this is where we're going to be successful and this is where we see you fitting in and adding even more value to that. Um, and so one one great thing that Dell Tech did is we were very, in, very vertical focused. So project-based organizations. That's what Dell Tech does. And, and they have a little bit answered, but people, you know, timesheets, projects, uh, you know, pro project-based accounting, that's the focus. And then lots of features and functionality, but it's a very precise, if you work with architects and engineers, you should probably partner with Delta. If you're government, work with government contractors, you should probably partner with Delta. And then you got to find out where, where do you fit in? And, and so kind of that sub niche, where's your sweet spot? Where can you play? And at Unit Four, we have a very similar story. We're, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're people based, so very close to what Dell Tech has, um, but with nonprofits and you know, professional service organizations and public sector, higher education. They're all people centric organizations. So when I'm trying to recruit a partner, it's very, it's very quick on identifying, showing them where we fit and and the value we can add to them, but more importantly, where our potential customers are. And because they, you really need to lead them where is the potential customer, um, and, and from there on, then all of a sudden you can build that business plan. Yeah, it sounds like um, you and your team take a, a really strategic and narrow approach in terms of the uh, the potential clients that, that that you guys are going after. Uh, yeah. I, I think I heard project management, timesheets, companies that are of those nature. Um, when yeah. when when we think about um, employee size, is there a specific employee size that that is really your your sweet spot at Unit Four or previously? Yeah, here at, yeah, here at Unit Four, it's mid market. So we're going to be looking at you know, for professional service organization. Three, four hundred employees up to 10, 15,000 employees. If you're a nonprofit, typically 80 to 100 million in assets and up. So, you know, great. If you, if you we, we show this, we have a, we have a chart, a chart that shows where we fit in. You have SAP and Oracle up here, and you've got the net suites and the dynamics down here. We're here in the middle. All right. And they, they struggle going up and down. So we're really in that uh, sweet spot. And again, that we're so focused on those specific verticals, it gives us a, one, it gives us a great edge with partners, more importantly, it gives us a great edge with prospects, and then we can deliver what those, when they become customers, we can actually deliver what they want, because that's all we do, right? We're not in 40 different verticals and you know, trying to different size and say, oh, here's our sweet spot. So it, from a partnering standpoint, allows them, them to bring us in and really not be a competitor to maybe an, if they're partnering with SAP already. Because we're going to play in a slightly different, different size space. Mm -hmm. Moving on, I, I think we might have just touched on this briefly in terms of like the recruitment process and partner identification. Um, yeah. Is is there any additional context that, that you you you'd like to add from from your perspective? Yeah, I think we probably all do it. Um, I, I think you do it in your world too. Is you go find someone similar and you figure out who their partners are, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I'm sure you you do it when you're looking for an employee that. You know, for a, if you have an opening that needs this type of experience, I'm sure you go right to their site and figure out, okay, what companies would have that. We do the exact same thing, exact same thing. Competitors. And then we also do, I've, we've actually had more success um, when you think of a startup is those industry um, industry events and associations. If you can tie into that, that's not only going to give you prospects, but it's anyone who's working in you know, that market 
they're hungry for content. They're hungry for it to bring someone to the table. So I think if you look at that startup, that plan, okay, what what industries, what you know, what networks are there, and then what other people belong to it that would be prospects. And and now all of a sudden you're networking into people talking the same language, and you'll find ISVs, you'll find resellers, you'll find service partners. Um, complementary relationships that I think you can drive awareness really quickly, really quickly. Absolutely. And um, moving on, when, when we think about lean positioning in terms of the um, your the product itself and kind of the approach and the yeah. strategy, um, you know, where where do you start in terms of, of lean positioning? Yeah, it's, I mean, again, we have limited resources and time, right, as a startup. So it's like, you know, that that value prop has, has to be there from a, whatever the, the widget is, whatever the solution is, whatever the service offering is, that has to be dialed in. And it, and it does have to be compelling, you know, very compelling, whether it's just quicker and easier, whether the cost, you know, the return on investment's lower, you know, there's 50 different things you can get, but that has to be a fit for that customer base, because then you can sell it to a partner why they should take on something. And when, when we think of a, a startup CRO, Andy, with the yeah. mindset of having a lean team internally, what, what are the must-have or critical positions that, that are needed to, uh, to run a successful partnerships function? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I, it, and you could take, take my answer as it, you know, if I say four people, it, it could be 40, right? It could be 400, <laughs> depends on how many people you need. But I mean, you obviously have to have the leadership role that's most important because that's a, an internal you know figure that has to be stood up in front of everybody including the investors and then that's the go-to person for answers and commitment when you're working with partners um, and then you need you have to have an enablement person you, you have to have somebody that can work internally with with the resources you may or may not have and figure out how do you put that in the partner's hands how do you get the feedback so that's a non-revenue generating position and it has to be there um, and then obviously you need part marketing and um, I've seen in experience with my experiences personally when partner marketing is kind of half in half out it's not real great you, know, you can start that way but eventually you have to have that partner marketing team where that's their full-time response that's their job every day is to get up and work with partners to, to put on programs and you know build, build pipeline and then it comes down to having great channel, you know, let's just call them channel managers. And those those are the, the people who can wear the different hats, but they have a selling arm to them. Um, they have a mentoring arm to them. They also have kind of a, uh, I want to call it a, you know, a business coach personality as well. So you have to take in what the partner's going through, be able to internalize it and come back with a solution. Um, and I found the best ones take it in, do a few comments, think about it for a few days, find a little bit of information, come back in, a, in you know, two, three days, a week later, and say, hey, maybe we should try this. And that could be a tense situation. It could be a positive thing, but just really internalizing it. And um, uh, so that those would be my, where I would say the, the key roles, you know, those, those, those four. Okay. And you, you mentioned the importance of partner marketing and really yeah. having their 100% their buy-in and ensuring that they are committed. Um, yep. have, have you seen higher ROI from in-person events or, or virtual events that you posted with your partners? Uh, lately, in-person events have been much more productive than virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, virtual, um, and which is frustrating because I think we had a good run of virtual events over the last few years and it just feels that the I think you get attendance people think they'll just watch the recording and they're not invested and you know but if you can do that the in-person event with customers prospects with partners um, you, you can cover so much more ground and and the beauty is you kind of work all day and all night with these people right because you end mm -hmm. up going to dinner and you're talking what do you talk about you talk about whatever you like, you know, personally, but yeah, it always ends up coming back to work. Um, but I, I do think from a partnering standpoint, recruiting partners, you gotta be in person with them. You have to have events and you have to have a reason to spend time with them and to plan it with them. And from a partner marketing side, 
just that level of investment and effort they put into a live event in person is it, it's all hands on deck. Whereas a webinar, you get people and you know sometimes people don't even know what happened. Um, <laughs> and I think that's you know very common these days. Very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the return to in person events is is becoming higher yeah. and higher, and um, virtual events yeah. are. Um, I don't want to say becoming extinct, but um, less, fre yeah. less frequent and popular than they were during the pandemic. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Um, well, this is a good segue into to the next section. Um, we'll yeah. discuss digital channels. And I know we just yeah. talked a lot about the, the importance of the, the in-person and, and virtual marketing, um, but curious to hear your thoughts on kind of the, the other uh, aspects of, of digital marketing. Yeah, and th this is... This is um... This is the biggest differentiator today, I think, for vendors, but also more importantly for partners. The, the partners that don't have this mindset, that don't have this as a natural motion, um, are, are, they're, left be, they're already left behind. Right? So I think this one is, is key. And a few years ago, you know, we used to feed the partners, hey, this, you know, we're going to put it all here. It'll feed into your feeds, pick which ones you want, and just kind of copy what you know, we do. Thank you very much. That still happens. I think it's still effective, but over time, you'd probably agree. We kind of wash out the noise when it comes to LinkedIn, you know, X, and you know, Instagram, and whatever social media tools you use. We've all developed these filters on it, and I think on the business side, it's even even tougher to get somebody's attention. And there's so much content on LinkedIn these days, um, and to start a practice to really build your brand and market on LinkedIn. You're, you're behind the time. So my point is when we're looking at new partners, it's one of the first places we go now. How, what is their digital, you know, their digital channel experience? What is their plan? What is their investment on it? And if they don't have one or it's kind of a shaky story, it's a red flag. It's really a red flag. Um, and again, some of our current partners do a phenomenal job. Just absolutely it's brilliant keep pointing our other partners, do you see what they're doing? Do you see what they're doing? Right? And they kind of come back like, Hi, where do we start? We'll call them because they're your peer and they will talk to you and ask them. That's the thing. They're the ones doing it. But that's a it's a really big challenge for some partners. But again, it's a differentiator when it comes to recruiting, it should be super high on the list. When, when we think about the kind of early infancy start of a relationship with uh, NSI, a GSI, Hyperscaler, et cetera, yeah. um, are, are there any challenges that you've encountered uh, very early on um, where like the digital channel or digital marketing function wasn't up to par or wasn't co uh, creating enough ROI for the, the relationship or partnership itself? Yeah, 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 a absolutely. And, and that comes down, I would say, or if I can take a turn on beating up on the partners a little bit, they don't always do a great job selling the relationship and the importance internally to their people. Mm. So you'll have meetings, you'll do this, talk about this, and a week later, no action's been taken. taken. And you're like, what happened? And you talk to your contacts and your team, like, hey, I don't know, and find out they got to go back and re-educate their internal teams of the importance of it. And then... What we also struggle is a lot of these SIs have other relationships that they've had for years and they kind of have a, they just have a better marketing rhythm, especially when it comes to the digital side than you will as the new, as the new kid on the block. So getting into that takes, takes time and it's, it's frustrating for the vendor partner marketing people because like, I'm not getting their attention and they're doing all these cool events and it just, you got to stay on them and, start slow let's get a couple things out there a couple things out there and then all of a sudden you'll get into their normal normal motion got it well said um and then the the last go-to-market strategy that we wanted to cover yeah. was was kpis so when we think about kpis it could be in the form yeah. of sourced revenue influence revenue or co-sell revenue um yeah. but interested in, in kind of hearing your thoughts on you know what kpis need to be tracked and um i need to be focused on yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know, the easiest one is typically if you have a resell co-sell channel, you know, where there's leads coming in from partners, you know, what's, what's it doing to ARR? That's, that's probably top of mind for, for everybody. And that's a, 
think that probably doesn't need any further explanation. Um, the more subtle ones are, and where you, I think you've got to be aware of how do you track wins, how do you track where like an SI has um, impact on you winning a deal, but maybe it's they're on the side of it but you know the work they're doing, you know having them at the table and, and vouching for you is driving business. It's a little harder to measure unless you have the right you know, CRM system and the right flags for the you know, type of partner. Like in, we use an influencer partner, right? An influencer partner makes no money off any deal we make, but guess what? They're critical to us winning that business. So we track that. We track that because we spend money with them. We spend time with them. They deliver services that maybe we can deliver. So being able to track some of those you know, there's seven or eight that you can build out. And then what I would say when it comes to KPIs, you know, tracking them, figuring out what's important. And again, you start with the top of the company. What metrics are they tracking? Where are they? What, you know, how are you being judged as a startup? And then mapping to those. And then the second part of KPIs is once you have those figured out, you're tracking them and matching what the, you know, the top of the organization is looking at. It's like, you have to be willing to change your partner strategy. You have to be willing to change. Um, if your initial model is like, hey, we're going to use all resellers, and you find out like, no, we can, partners can be more successful being a co-sell partner, and so will we, you have to be able to make those adjustments. So not like the drastic change I mentioned earlier, we just scrap it, but you can adjust your priorities, and that may adjust what partners you bring in. Um, but I've found, especially here, is if we adjust our plans and we can tell partners why, they're on board. And you can show them their ROI and the investment they're going to get back. Um, but I think that that's a key is just you can't be married to just it's this way or the highway. Right? You know, manage, we're only going to have managed services. Well, what if you need a little bit of managed services that get you know, you know another way to, to do that? It's just, so I think that flexibility and being aware of that early. So it brings back to tracking KPIs, being aware of them and monitoring them. Um, and sharing those internally, and if you can, if you're allowed externally, allows people that transparency and how the business is doing. And, and partners are smart; they may come up with a better way for you, for for the relationship. So, again, the more information you can share and have dialogue, you can you can find that right right solution for everybody at the end. And Andy, when when we think about KPIs, you know, we we hear a lot in in the industry about having a, a four to one or six to one ratio in terms of services revenue versus software revenue. Um, yeah. Is 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 that a kind of a a good standard, or um, would love to hear from from you what you and your team look for in terms of services? Yeah, versus yeah. I would say here at Unit Four, it's it's higher than that. It's much higher than that, and and we have a we have the benefit of our ERP solution is really a platform that has our own ERP in it. So what that platform does, it's it's not doing it commercially, but it's the most modern ERP there is in the market when it comes to the platform and integration capability. So what we're finding on our deals, again, because of our solution, is yeah, you know, we'll implement our thing, you know, our product. The four X is probably right, Doug. But then when you talk to the SIs around the project, it might be 10x, maybe mm. 12x. Um, and, then you, and then you're like, well, how, over how many years? And it's, it's over many, many, many years because they're going to integrate. They'll use our industry mesh to link in with the Microsoft CRM or Dynamics, or there's a payroll tool that they want to build to, or, or an HR solution, or some homemade system that, the, that somebody made. So, so from a, our solution, yeah, that four to six X, fine. It needs to come down. The market is demanding that it comes down and becomes more streamlined. That's that's a fact. So, um, if, if you get down to that one to one, one to two, I think that's what customers are going to expect. But that ancillary work with the, the SIs and the you know our people that are doing around the projects, it's uh, it's immense. It's really immense, and and that's what they're great at, and we're Hey, you guys keep doing that. We'll do what, what we're good at. Is the, is the right, I think the right model for people. Great. And Andy, as as we wrap up here with the final a couple questions, um, sure. we've we've covered a lot around building uh, alliances function for for startups uh, to be successful. Um, is yeah. is there any advice that that you'd like to share with our audience or um, anything um, that would be worth 
that's po positive reinforcement that that would be worth sharing yeah. with the audience well yeah it, i mean it, it works part, part, partnering works and finding the right model you know, the right the right investment structure and the right partners is is not always easy but it's going to drive drive revenues bookings ar whatever company whatever you're trying to drive the company um, higher customer loyalty scores i mean a good partner program enhances all of that no question about it. You can look at just about any successful company that has some type of partner where it's made, it's been the difference maker. It's been the difference maker. And how you pull those levers, uh, maybe I'm a little weird. I think that's the fun part, right? That's the enjoyable <laughs> part is like figuring out which ones do we pull and when, and then go execute it and, uh, and go from there. Awesome. Um, yeah. in, in terms of our audience, who, who should reach out to you and why? Uh, and what's the best way to, to contact uh, or what's the best way to connect with you or, or get in touch with our yeah. audience? Um, so I would say, you know, anyone, you know, that's looking from a building a partner program or trying to figure out how to tweak your fix their partner program. Absolutely. Happy to talk to you about that. Um, and LinkedIn is, is typically the easiest way. Um, I'm on it like everyone else every day, all day, it seems like. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then if there's partners out there who just wants to talk about, hey, we're not sure how to you know, work with this vendor or how to expand, I'm happy to talk to you. I may not have the right program for you, but, you know, being on the other side and give some, some advice and conversation. But I'd love to, if anyone's interested and wants to you know, talk more about this, I've got myself, I've got a whole team of partner veterans that I've worked with over the years that kind of odd that we'll talk about it anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, thank, thank you so much for joining us on our 33rd episode. Um, we, we really appreciate you taking the yeah. time to highlight the importance and best practices of a partnership function today. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for the opportunity, Doug. Appreciate it.